The theme for tonight, uh, for the whole conference, is Church for the Churchless. One of the biggest issues that I find happening in Canada, Jacob assures me it's not a Canadian thing, it's all over the world, is people are saying, where can I find a church? And you know, the thing is, is it's getting scarcer and scarcer to find a Bible teaching, Bible believing, Word of God church. But at the same time, if you are a history buff at all, you'll realize that this also happened once before. Um, and Jesus even warned the Jews. He said, the time will come where they will put you out of the synagogues. And churchless happens three or four ways. One of them is you're asked to leave. I don't know if that's your experience, any of you, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, another way is God just tells you you need to come out, which was one of my experiences. God told me I need to come out. Um, I did, I obeyed him because it was so definite. And once I was out, I had the same question many of you are asking, where do I go? And um, just to let you have a little warning, God always answers. And he said to me, he said, um, did Abraham know exactly where he was going? Just trust me. I'll take you to where you need to go. And it was about a year later, I ended up with Moriel. So um, that's the second way. Another way, which um, again, thanks to Alan, the guy working in the back, he told me, he said, what about the people that are frozen out of their church? I hadn't considered that. Many people, you know, if you, if you start asking the wrong questions or too many questions, suddenly it's almost like you're shunned within. They don't throw you out of the church. Um, but you really feel that coolness, that edge, where suddenly you're not invited out for all the dinners or anything, and, and pretty soon it, it has its effect. You wander out. Nobody likes to be where they're not welcome. Fourth, uh, um, that was one, two, three. A fourth way is if you move. We're in a very mobile society nowadays, you move. Where are you going to find a church? And, and if you're like some of the people I know after about three or four times, you just give up. So hopefully we're going to give you guys some answers and hopefully we can assist you in whatever you're doing. That one of the aspects of Montreal in Canada is to assist people however we can assist you. That is what we want to do. I'm not going to pretend that I'm a great orator like John Haller or uh, Jacob Prash. Um, so I'm just going to leave it at that and say bless all of you. You know, stay in touch with us, please, please, please. We're really happy to have John Haller with us. Came all the way up here. So tonight, I want to talk about uh, provisions for the last days. We do live at a very unique time in history. Um, okay. Did it move? There we go. So we we talk about all of these different prophecies and that type of thing. I will emphasize what Blair talked about a little bit in his introduction that, and I'm sure Jacob will say this and Marco will say this as well, that those of us who have, for whatever reason, a bit of a public ministry, the question we get asked the most is exactly what Blair said, where can I find a church? How can I find a church? I can't find a church. I can't find anybody compatible with, um, with what, with what I believe. So as I, okay. So I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, this is a little bit difficult to coordinate this because it's not, 
uh, the screen's over there and the screen's there, so I just want to make sure they're doing this. But this has been uh, how, tr how the church, how believers in God relate to each other has been an issue since the beginning of the church. As we get closer to the end, though, a lot of things will change. You will see things changing in many, many respects. I talk about this this week. Jacob talks about it. Marco talks about it in our prophecy updates. We talked about this at dinner tonight. And whenever we get together, we always talk about, I, I can't believe what I'm seeing, what's happening in the world. We talked about some restrictions that uh, are placed on people in Canada that might not be us on us in the United States yet, but they're coming. Uh, I'll talk tomorrow a little bit about a court case that just came down in England where they just said, listen, you can be a Christian, but you can't, you can't hold that kind of a belief. The Supreme Court, the top court in England said, they're determining what Christianity Christians can believe and express publicly. And this is all very disconcerting to believers. Throughout the history of the people of God, Israel and then the church, there have always been prophets and leaders and pastors who have stood up and told people what they need to do. And I want to talk a little bit about this. First, I'm going to talk about a historical place that I've been to that is incredibly significant in biblical history. Then I'll go into Paul and I'll talk a little bit about what Paul says about how to prepare yourselves in the last days and how to act as a believer. And we'll look at mainly his passage in Ephesians chapter 4 and 6 and the passage in Ephesians 6 on the armor of God. So let's... Uh, Let's go to this passage with Moses. And Moses, there we go. I have to make sure they're the same. Okay. And Moses with the elders of Israel. This is happening before they enter into the promised land. It's near the end of Moses' life. I once did a series called Famous Last Words. What are the last words that people say? So I focused on Second, Te Second Timothy and what Paul had to say when he knew he was facing imminent execution at the hands of the Romans. Moses knows he's not entering into the Holy Land, so he's giving these this talk. And so what he says is, he says this in Deuteronomy chapter 27, and Moses with the elders of Israel commanded the people saying, keep all the commandments which I commanded you this day. And it shall be on the day when you shall pass over Jordan unto the land which the Lord God has given thee, that thou shalt set up three great, set thee up great stones and plaster them with plaster. And thou shalt write upon them all the words of this law when thou art passed over, that thou mayest go in unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, a land that floweth with milk and honey as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee. And Moses, verse 9, And the priests and the Levites spake unto all Israel, saying, Take heed and hearken, O Israel, this day thou art become the people of the Lord thy God. And Moses charged the people the same day. And then he gets to the place that I want to talk about just briefly. He tells them that, listen, you're going to go over the land and you're going to go to Shechem. Shechem's a very important city, a very important biblical city. And he's going to tell them what they're going to do in Shechem. The, and this is a city that Jacob purchased a well in Shechem. Abraham stopped there while he was sojourning in the land. And it's going to be a very pivotal and important part in the history of Israel, especially from the terms of how they're going to act as the people of God. So he says this in Deuteronomy chapter 29, even all the nations shall say, wherefore, wherefore hath the Lord done this unto the, unto this land? What meaneth the heat of this great anger? See, what he's telling them is, listen, you're, you're going to go into the land. You're going to go to Shechem and you're going to be divided. I'm going to put six tribes on one mountain. I'm going to put six tribes on the other. Shechem sits in a valley. I'll show you a couple of pictures in a moment. And one side's going to say the blessings that will come upon Israel if you keep God's promises. 
and the other side will shout the curses. And this was no small feat when this happened. From the census that we have in, in some of the, in the Torah, certainly when they divided the people between these two mountains, and the mountains are about a mile apart, it's a natural amphitheater, they were um, about probably two million people, a million people on each mountain, shouting curses on one mountain, blessings on the other. I imagine to the people that live there that it was a pretty awesome and intimidating sight. But Moses warned them that, look, you're going to forget what happened. You're, you're going to forget what God told you. And God's going to send you out into the nations. And this is what he's talking about in, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 29. And even all the nations shall say, Wherefore hath the Lord done this, done thus unto this land? What meaneth the heat of his great, of this great anger? Then men shall say, because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers, which he made them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. For they went and served other gods and worshiped them, gods whom they, they knew not and whom he had not given unto them. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land to bring it upon all the curses that are written in this book. And the Lord rooted them out of their land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. The secret things belong unto the Lord God, the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to all the, of our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So what happens is he sends them to Shechem, located in the mountains of Israel. Modern day, it's called the West Bank. Judea, this is in Samaria. And so Shechem sits in this, um, this valley between two mountains. Here's looking at it from looking towards the Mediterranean. Okay. I'm, I apologize. This is, uh, if you go to the British Museum in London today, you can find these letters called the Armana Letters. Uh, we were there last fall. We got to the gallery, by the way. It was one of the things I wanted to see. I wanted to see uh, the Sennacherib, the Taylor Prism, the, the cylinder that talked about Sennacherib. I wanted to see some of the Mesopotamia things. I wanted to see the Armana Letters. And they're quite little. They would fit in your pocket. They look like big rocks with writing on them. And of course, there was a rope up that the gallery was closed. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I can see them on the wall. I know exactly where they're supposed to be. I can see them back there, but I want to see them up close. And a guard came up and I said, uh, I want to see those. He goes, the gallery's closed. I'm like, uh, I buy you a cup of coffee, you know, and you just kind of knock the rope off as you're leaving to go get your coffee. And he kind of laughed. He says, you know, I can't do that. He goes, it should be open in an hour and a half. So we came back and we got to see him. These letters were written. These were discovered in Egypt. They're letters that talk about the, there are people that are overrunning the land known as the, Can the land of Canaan at the time of the conquest. And the letters talk about these people that have come and occupied the hill country that we know as Judea and Samaria. And archaeologists often will say, well, there, there's no evidence that the Hebrews, the Jews, the, the Israelites, they were ever in the land at this, at this time. The whole conquest that's talked about in Joshua is, is just a myth. But this letter talked about these people at the time, historically they should be there, and it referred to them as the Haparu people. Haparu, Hebrew, kind of sounds a little bit the same. And so they, you know, so people, the evidence is staring right in their face, and they still say, well, there was never anyone there. And the evidence is overwhelming that there were people there. When you drive through that part of Israel, 
And I don't think I'm exaggerating this. You can drive 20, 30, 40 miles from Jerusalem north, and every hillside, every mountain is terraced for farming from top to bottom. Every single one. It's now our guide that we had to take us around that day, Joel Kramer, he, he was, I kept talking about, I can't believe what I'm seeing. And he goes, nobody ever has been that impressed with this. And I said, well, it's impressing me because there were a lot of people here that were engaged in farming and vineyards and that type of thing to support every hillside for miles and miles and miles and miles. And yet archaeologists say, well, there were never anybody there. Now today, the city of Shechem, the ancient city of Shechem, sits within Nablus. And oh, I wonder, if I see one coming into that window, I am, I'm out of here, okay? The, um, as you drive through the city of Nablus, and most Israeli citizens have never been there because it is illegal for them to enter into this area. It's area A. It's under the control of the Palestinian Authority. And you see murals like this everywhere through the town. Every intersection is a martyr square of some kind. Nablus is known as the city of martyrs, the city of Palestinian martyrs. And you'll see pictures of young men smiling. And the mural is based on a picture that was taken of them just before they went to Israel to slaughter Jews in a suicide bombing. They're everywhere that you look. Now, the ancient city of Shechem, as I said, sat in this valley. Between uh, Mount Ebal, you can see that on your right, Mount Gerizim on the left. Mount Gerizim was the um, home of the Samaritans. You remember the Samaritan, the woman, the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well in John chapter 8. And she came from a little village near the city of Shechem. And remember, she said, listen, and when you stand in Shechem, you can look up on the mountain, Mount Gerizim, and you can see a temp ruins of a temple up there. And when you stand at Jacob's well, you can see the ruins of a temple up there. And it's where she pointed to it. And she said, well, you people work, worship in Jerusalem, and you people worship, we worship in this mountain. And Jesus says, you know, someday there's a, coming a time when people will worship him in spirit and truth. The evidence is the evidence is overwhelming as to what happens. I said this that would be the greatest PowerPoint ever. There it is. That's the mountain where we worship. So Shechem was this phenomenal city. And at the end of his life, like Moses had done at the end of his life, at the end of Joshua's life, he gathered the children of Israel together to talk to them. So I'll read the story, and then you can catch up. This is from Joshua chapter 24. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time. What he does is he's going to engage in human history of the people of God. Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. And I gave unto Isaac, Jacob, and Esau, and I gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his children went down into Egypt, and I sent Moses also and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them, and afterward I brought you out. And I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and ye came into the sea, and the Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and horsemen unto the Red Sea. And when they cried unto the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes have seen what, I've, what I have done in Egypt. And he dwelt in the wilderness a long season. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side of Jordan. And they fought with you. And I gave them unto your hand 
that you might possess their land, and I destroyed them before you. Then Balak the son of Zippor, the king of Moab, arose and warned against Israel and sent and called Balaam the son of Beor to curse you. But I would not hearken unto Balaam, therefore he blessed you still, so I delivered you out of his hand. This is Joshua talking. And you went over Jordan and came unto Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you, the Amorites and the Perizzites, and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Girgashites, and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I delivered them into your hand. And I sent the hornet before you, which drove, which drove them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with thy sword, nor with thy bow. And I gave you a land for which ye did not labor, and cities for which ye did, built not. And ye dwell in them, of the vineyards and the olive yards which ye planted, ye not do ye eat. Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord." And if it seem evil unto this day to serve the Lord, choose this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods of the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites, in whose hand ye, land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Listen, friends, this is what a lot of us have faced, are facing, and will face in the future we have to decide what we're going to do. How are we going to, are we going to serve God or are we going to serve man? Because you see, what's happening in the church today is that Egypt is in the church. And the story that, that Joshua relayed to them, the history was, you know, I, have constantly delivered you out of their hand, is what God says. So I would just try to encourage you, as you look at stories like this throughout the Old Testament, you see a faithful God loving his people and protecting them and giving them a way of escape. I'll talk about it a little bit tomorrow. It is a very, very difficult thing to do, to leave a church, to lead people that you love, to lead ministries that you have. It is a very, very difficult thing to do. So Joshua said, look, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For Lord our God, he is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, which, and which did those signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, even the Amorites, which dwelt in the land. Therefore, we will also serve the Lord, for he is our God. And Joshua said unto the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If ye forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn on you and do you hurt and consume you. After that he hath done you good. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said unto the people, You are witnesses against yourselves that ye have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the books of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord, which he spake unto us. It shall be therefore a witness unto you, lest ye deny your God." And today you can go to Shechem 
and put your hands on the stone. I'm convinced it's a stone. A lot of most people are. Most thinking people are. The actual stone that Joshua erected there is a memorial to the covenant and, and what was said that day. When the archaeologists excavated this back in the 1800s, they found a stone in the temple area. There was a temple fortress, the largest in the land of Canaan that they found. And next to it is this was a giant stone about seven meters tall. It was broken. They broke it into three pieces and took away two, two of the pieces. And they said, well, well, wait a minute. We should have looked at the Bible. And they said, this is, we think this is the stone of Joshua, the actual stone that he erected that you can go and touch today. It's covered by uh, Palestinian graffiti. I don't even think people know the significance of what happened there. But listen, we know in, in, in uh, Corinthians, it tells us that the things that happened to Israel happened to them for, as examples for us so that we shouldn't go their way. So the stories are not to run down the people of Israel. They're, they're there as a warning to all of us, to all of us that are in churches, and organizations that may have lost their way theologically and doctrinally. And at some point, you will have to make a decision, and a lot of you, I think, have already made that decision, that you have to essentially get out of Egypt. God will bless that decision, but you need to, you need to do it. Uh, it's hard. I'll talk about it tomorrow morning. It is incredibly difficult to do. But Shechem and the stone of Joshua stands there as a memorial to us today to remember what it was that God did among the people of Israel and the warnings that he gave them. He warned them over and over and over again, you need to do this. You need to follow the Lord. You need to serve the Lord. And if you don't, this is what will happen. Now, I grew up in a pastor's home. My dad was a very faithful pastor his entire life. Uh, he actually passed away at the age of 68, sitting at his desk, working on his Sunday sermon. Thank you. Okay. Praise the Lord. So, well, let me, let me back this up. There you go. That's the stone of Joshua that you can see at Shechem today. It would have been three times that high. That, that stone there is about seven feet tall from the ground to the top. But it stands there today, and the people that live in the apartments and homes around that, they, they don't have a clue what's there. I'm sure there are archaeologists that work in the museum that's there at the tell of Shechem. And I'm sure they don't understand what's there. Listen, as people of God, we need to be careful that we always understand what God has said and what God will do. I'm going to read a passage for you. I think you're intelligent enough to pick out what's important. I might have a couple comments about it, but this is Ephesians chapter 4. The epistles give us great information about how we should live as Christians. Now, I could stand up here and I could talk to you about you need to go buy, you know, the Jim Baker freeze-dried freeze food package, uh, you know, and, and get 90 days supply and maybe 120 days uh, if you want to share it with your neighbor. But I'm not going to do that. You know, you know, you're smart enough to figure that out. And regardless, there, there could be an economic collapse. We all know this. These uh, tear-me-down homes that I see down here in Richmond that are selling for, like, what, one and a half, two million dollars? Um, it doesn't seem that that's sustainable. But the epistles give us, especially Ephesians, gives us practical advice as to how we should live. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, Paul speaking, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, for bearing one another in love, to keep the unity of the Spirit in the 
bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called in the hope of, in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure. There we go. But to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the faith of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he has ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended far, far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. The problem of this in today's church Charlatans, false teachers, deceivers, is epidemic. And Paul, like Moses, like Joshua, warned the pe- warns the people of God about what they're supposed to avoid. Verse, um, the warnings throughout Jesus when he's talking in his Olivet Discourse are always more more than anything else, as Jacob has pointed out many times, beware of deception. Take heed that ye be not deceived. That's in Luke chapter 21. In Mark uh, uh, 13, for many shall come in my name and shall deceive many. Matthew 24, and Jesus had answered and said to them, take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name and shall deceive many. He tells them in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, Whoso readeth, he talks about the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, which does help out because it identifies who wrote Daniel. I mean, I'm going to take Jesus' word for it over some guy in a university someplace that doesn't really have a high view of Scripture. But look at what he says. Whoso readeth, let him understand. So back to Ephesians chapter 4. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working of the measure in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk, not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them and because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling have forgiven themselves over to lasciviousness. Do you, do you notice that when these false teachers fall, it's very often involves sexual immorality? Look, Todd Bentley is only one of the last in a long, 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 long list of false teachers who have fallen, who claim the name of Christ, but have fallen into sexual immorality. I mean, Paul says, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that ye might put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. 
Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. I marvel. Paul, and Paul, you know, Paul had some of the harshest words that he used. And Paul could be a, a pretty biting person, person at times. Jesus was as well. You know, we often confuse uh, speaking the truth in love with uh, speaking like a wimp, if I could be so bold. That's not the way it is. Sometimes you have to be bold. When I, I look around um, the craziness in our culture, where in our culture sexual orientation is considered to be fixed, but your biological, cons- your biological sex that you're born with is fluid and can be changed on a whim. I think you would all agree this is insanity. And what they're doing to children, I see the stories every week from the West, from all over the West, from the UK, from the United States, from Canada. What is being done to young children is child abuse. And I don't know how you speak the truth and love without being pretty harsh about that. We have a lot of, I don't know, probably a dozen, well, I think, I don't know, 10 or 11 great nieces and one great, one great nephew. I'm afraid for those precious little kids. I don't know how you cannot speak the truth without sounding harsh, even if you're doing it in love at times. And so Paul talked about this in Galatians chapter 1. I marvel that this was with some people who come with the false gospel. And I see certain movements within the church, within evangelicalism, that come up with a different gospel. Joel Osteen, that's a, that's a pretty easy one. But there are other people who say, well, maybe the gospel will change at some point to something else. They'll go back keeping the law. I don't see that. And I think Paul deals with that. And I, I don't think there's a time stamp on Paul's teaching here in Galatians that says, okay, this will expire at some point in the future and you don't have to pay attention to this. If, if you, I'm going to read it. If you see a time stamp, raise your hand. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you other than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Back to Ephesians. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good used to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking put away, be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as the Lord your God has for Christ's sake forgiven you. That's a great chapter. If you want to look like, what, what does God say the church should do in the end times? The warning is there. It's the same warning that Joshua gave to the people of Israel. It's the same warning that Moses gave to the people of Israel. It's the same warning that Moses gave to the uh, kingdom of Judah. It's the same warning that Isaiah gave. All the prophets gave. Be faithful. Remain faithful to the Lord. It hasn't, the message really has not changed. Jesus died on the cross, that changed the gospel. So these are what I consider to be provisions for the end times. And then there's one more. Finally, 
This is in Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We're to be strong in the Lord. It's spiritual warfare. I will confess, last night, I was not in a good mood. Think, first part of the trip went great, then it seemed like everything fell apart. And I was talking to a friend about that today. And I'll paraphrase what he said to me. Oh, sounds like you had some spiritual warfare going against you there. Did you bathe yourself in prayer before you left? With this subtitle, you moron. Did you even think about praying about it before you left? And I had to say, no, I thought I could do it on my own. Uh, and it didn't go all that well. But there is spiritual warfare out there. It is, um, as I look through the news and prepare things for the prophecy updates I do, sometimes I just... I sit there and I shake my head. I'm sure Jacob does it. I'm sure Marco does it. It's like, okay, listen. I knew that the prophets warned us, that Jesus warned us, that in the end times things would get dark. And boy, I have to admit, I never expected it to get like this. And I don't know how much worse it's going to be before the Lord returns. I suspect that it's going to get much worse, much worse. So Paul gives some admonitions there in Ephesians chapter 6 about how Christians can protect themselves. So I'm going to take a look at this, and I'm going to look back a little bit at some of the Old Testament foundations for what's said here about the armor of God. Wherefore, take upon you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand an evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So in the midst of there, it says, have your loins girt about with truth. It is very difficult in this world to know what's true. You may have noticed that in the United States that there is a bit of a toxic political culture going on right now. I suspect you have a national election coming up here in Canada and I think you probably have a bit of the same thing going on. Uh, fortunately, we don't have to pay, we have enough of our own problems in the United States to pay attention to your problems I know a little bit about your problems, and you have big problems. <clears throat> I watch things. I watch our president say something, <clears throat> whether you like him or not. And then I watch the analysis later, and it's like, did you watch the same thing that I just watched? I saw an article today that there are these, uh, don't know if you've seen stories about these uh, fake videos that they're able to put out take your face, your data points from your face, and create a video that looks like you're saying something that you never said. And now, with technology, they're able to match the voice. And so it becomes increasingly difficult for people, even Christians, to understand what's true and what's not true. It is a difficult thing. And 2,000 years ago almost, Paul was writing and saying, listen, this is one of the foundational things you have to do is be committed to people of truth. And he also says this, that uh, your loins going to burn about truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the pressure, preparation of the gospel of peace. And I want to give credit to Jacob and to Mike Clapham, a fellow elder at Fellowship Bible Chapel in Sunbury, Ohio, for opening my understanding about the number of times that aspects of the 
armor of God are spoken of throughout the Old and New Testaments. It's, it's stunning when you look into it. I'm going to share a few of those with you tonight. But um, Paul continues in Ephesians 6, Above all, taking the shield of faith, whereby ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto all the perseverance and supplication for all the saints. This is what my friend said to me last night. Hey, did you pray about this? Um, no, but, you know, I, w I thought about it. <laughs> Listen, we need to bathe ourselves, ministries, each other, other ministries, churches, in a lot of prayer these days. Do it while you're driving down the road, staring down the road. Just pray. That's when I do a lot of mine, when I'm faithful to it. But that's, that's going to be key. In Isaiah chapter 52, it talks about messianic prophecies. And I want to focus on the passage that says, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This is related to the ministry of Jesus, the future ministry of Jesus. And while it does have a current application to us as redeemed people of God, it also has a future aspect because what we see throughout these prophecies is that Jesus will return as the conquering king. So it is an aspect of the gospel that I think a lot of people overlook. You know, people will say, well, we're saved by the gospel of grace through faith and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But there is this, there's this future aspect of the gospel that is overlooked a lot. And it's talked about throughout the Old Testament, and Paul picks up on those themes in Ephesians chapter 6. And so it says here, verse 6, Isaiah chapter 52, Therefore my people shall know my name, therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that does speak. Behold, it is I. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Verse 8. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, and the voice together shall they sing. For they shall see eye to eye, when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Break ye into joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted his people, he hath redeemed Jerusalem. And there's a connection there between, uh, when you look at Isaiah chapter 52, it says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good news. Then Paul picks up the same thing in Ephesians chapter 6 and says that you're to have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In Romans chapter 10, Paul picks up the same theme again. He says, and they shall preach, how shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And he came to, uh, we know that there's this aspect of Jesus as the returning king. And I think it's time that we begin focusing on that. When Jesus began his public ministry in Nazareth, you know the story, he went to the synagogue. He picked up the, the scroll of Isaiah, and he started reading. And it says this in Luke chapter 4, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, as was his custom. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for him to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And then he begins to read from the scroll, and he says this, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the scroll and he sat down and stopped reading. Now, when you go to Isaiah 61, where he was reading from, 
And he goes on when he was there reading, and he says, today this story, you know, this is, scripture has been fulfilled in your, your hearing. And they got upset. They took him out to throw him off the precipice there outside of Nazareth. But when he was reading from Isaiah chapter 61, he stopped in the middle. When he got to the proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, he shut the book and sat down. But that's not the whole prophecy of... That's, there, that, so what it means is that there was a future aspect yet to Jesus' ministry that he was going to fulfill at some point in the future. And even as to us, it's still at some point in the future that he's going to fulfill it. And what the what it what it says that he stopped reading in Isaiah chapter sixty one verse two is to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and what he left out was in the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. In Isaiah chapter 61 is this great prophecy talking about Jesus returning at the end times. After he returns, he will go to Basra. Now that's down in the area of Petra, Edom. And he will lead his people to Jerusalem. And the prophecy says this, Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra, that this that, this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? And the answer is, I have tread in the wine press alone. And of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in my anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments. I will stain, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, should be down around slide 80, and I looked and there was none to help. This is Isaiah chapter 63 now. I wondered there was none to uphold, therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me and my fury to help me. So you see this continual theme that there is this day coming when Jesus will come back and he will exact vengeance on his enemies and he will pour out his wrath. But then the, the, the other side of that is peace. And it's an aspect of the gospel that I think we often um, overlook. So in Isaiah chapter 59, I want to get to a slide. Uh, do you know what slide you're on over there? Oh, okay. We're all caught up. Thank you very much. And he saw that there was no man, this is Isaiah chapter 59, and wondered that, that there was no intercessor, therefore his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness had sustained him. I'll skip down to verse uh, 18. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. To the islands he will repay recompense. Listen, folks, all the stuff that bothers you, and it, listen, if it doesn't bother you, that you need to check your heart, <laughs> the stuff that's going on. We know in Second Peter chapter 2, he talks about Lot. We know Jesus said it would be as in the days of Lot. And in Second Peter chapter 2, <clears throat> it says Lot, righteous Lot. It refers to righteous Lot. And he was vexed in his spirit by the evil things that he saw going on around him. This is the Howard paraphrase. If, if, if it doesn't bother you, that you have a problem. But you need to know that someday the fulfillment of this great gospel of peace will, Jesus will make it all right. And so you have great hope in what is going to happen in the future. In fact, it says this, and the Redeemer shall come, and the Redeemer shall come to Zion, 
and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. Someday there will be a fixed point in time when it will all be made right. Maybe in our lifetimes, some of us may be alive, some of us, some of you, your children may be alive to see that actually happen. Well, we'll all be there, by the way, but you will not have to go through the death process to get to that other side. But it will happen. This is a glorious promise. And so when it seems dark, well, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 picks up on some of these themes that Paul puts out in Ephesians chapter 6 about the armor of God. And I'll finish up with this passage. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Whoops. There we go. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they say, shall say peace and safety, then sudden, travail, sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. Am I in the right? Sorry. <laughs> I'm looking at three screens. Uh, usually, my wife will tell you, you're only looking at two at one time, and now you're looking at three and talking at the same time. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, that they might, and they that uh, be drunken are drunken in the night. So what, what is the condition, the spiritual condition that Paul likens these unbelievers to? They're drunk. They're comatose. But you are not to be that way. But let us, who are of the day, be sober. And here he talks about, he picks up on this theme that he talks about in Corinthians, the great love chapter, now abideth faith, hope, and love. Now he's going to flesh this out with some additional truth. But let us who are of the day, your children of light, your children of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that we, whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another. I think Blair made a very good point at the, in the introduction here today. You, you can't do this alone. You need other believers around you. And it's not easy to find them, but a lot of times I tell people, listen, you seem like you're a faithful person. Find others and start a group on your own. Do you know this is happening all over the world? There, there are no, to my knowledge, there are no evangelical theological cemeteries in Iran. Do you know? There's, there's a video out right now. Now, listen, I will make a disclaimer here. The fact that I might refer to something does not mean that I agree with everything that the person in that video has said, will say, or ever will say in the future. But I think they make a good point. And there's a video out called Sheep Among Wolves, put out by Dalton Thomas and Joel Richardson, talking about a revival in Iran, of all places. Do they have fuller theological cemetery in Iran? No. That's maybe why they're having the revival, right? And these people are gathering I don't know if I used it in one of my updates, but a friend of mine was in, um, I probably shouldn't say the country that he was in. Um, it was a group of believers. 
gathered in a country where they're under severe persecution. My understanding is one of the people there that night at that church service was someone from another country who left, a Christian. Why? Because I was going to be drafted into the army of my country, and if I'm drafted into the army, all of my colleagues in the military will be Muslim, and when they have the opportunity, they will kill me. I assure you, nothing we undergo here in the West does that. They're under severe persecution. They're careful, but I noticed in the video that the person sent to me, it was very interesting because there were a couple guys there uh, sitting at a table, running the PowerPoint, and they had a TV screen with the worship songs up on the TV screen. And even though they're persecuted, the one thing I noticed that stuck out to me in that video was in the window, in this town, in a, in a country where they were persecuted for their faith, was a neon flashing cross in the window. Why? Because we are children of the day. We are to be light. And those believers, as difficult as it was, gathered together under horrible circumstances. I complain about bad traffic coming from Seattle. Nothing compared to what my brothers and sisters in the Lord are going through in the Middle East and Africa. So, wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as you also do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now let me exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. By the way, there's no footnote there that says, hey, by the way, this is going to be really easy. This is going to be difficult to do. We're going to operate in the Spirit. And then he gives us a list, a laundry list of things. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Jesus Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. One of them in that list, pray without ceasing. And he says this, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. By the way, I, I love, as a lawyer, I like good arguments. Paul's a great lawyer. Sentences are a little bit wordy. I've tried to, I had to diagram them in Greek class back in college. But he makes great arguments. And the conclusions that it leads to are wonderful. And the very God of peace Sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body preserve blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Again, this echoes the theme that we see in the Armor of God passage in Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now the next verse I'm going to read is the last one I'm going to read tonight. I probably heard this verse more in my life spoken publicly than any other verse. My father was a pastor. He closed every service with this passage from the book of Jude. Verse 24. Um, being a pastor's kid, to be honest with you, you get tired of hearing the guy speak, your dad speak. And I can remember my brother and I, my sister was off to college, but, but she was older, but we'd go on vacation, and we always went to church on vacation. And I thought, I'm going to get to hear somebody else this Sunday. I cannot begin to tell you the number of times we were walking into a church 
And somebody said, oh, Brother Haller, would you like to preach for us today? And Dad always said yes. So it seems like every Sunday of my life, till I went away to college, I heard these verses in Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. These verses, the ones I showed you, will help you prepare for the last days. Can we pray? Father, we are so grateful for the truth that you gave us, the sword of the Spirit that is the Word of God, to provision us, to help us to stand strong and faithful in dark and increasingly darker days. Bless us, Lord, I pray that those that are listening to this, that are having trouble finding people, that you will open doors for them, to find people in their area that they can fellowship with and guide them in, with your spirit in truth. Bless us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.